So it's coming up to the end of April and a lot of what we need to sow has already been sown, hopefully. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to go through a few highlights for May and June. And yeah, I'm going to record the screen off my iPad and put it down the side of the screen there so you can see what I'm looking at. So we start off with Crown Prince and Trumpuccino squashes. Now, I've already sown my first batch. There's always a risk, though, that you'll put them out and then there'll be really stormy weather or something like that and the growth will be checked. They probably won't die, but I find it's probably, you know, if they're looking really sickly, they often don't recover and it can take them months to sort of, you know, re-establish themselves and get moving. It's better just to often just put replacement plants in. So I'm just going to do a few of my spare favourites. Uh, as I say, Crown Prince and Trombuccino. I, I really like the Trombuccino, even though I can't pronounce the name of it, because it's so versatile. You know, if you can't eat them all, you can just leave them to grow and you just get really great winter squashes that will keep until, well, sort of January time at least. Um, and, you know, if you can keep up with them, you can harvest them smaller and to make a really great uh, sort of courgette alternative, but better. So then we're going to do a batch of lettuce. We're always doing batches of lettuce. Um, we're just going to do Little Gem and Grenoble Red and Rickia and Canasta. And I just want to highlight Canasta because it is, I think, one of the really great summer lettuces. And we'll eat it up until about October time, something like that. Um, it's just so crunchy and really tasty and it looks really nice as well, kind of a bronze tinge to the leaves and things. There, there can be some issues getting good quality seeds that will germinate well, uh, but anyway it's worth the risk in my opinion, it's really great. And I'm also trying quite a few Salanovas this year and I think I got those from Just Seed. I think they're the only place you can get them actually in the UK. And they're really expensive, but they look really nice. And so we're kind of growing those in the potager, the front of the house, um, just because they look so pretty that, you know, I think they're prettier than flowers myself. But, uh, and Navara, which looks pretty good as well, um, and it's not as expensive. So then we're doing the second batch of the sweet corn. I think I'm going to do three batches of sweet corn this year. And the first batch is already chitting behind me on that rack there. And hopefully those will be ready for planting out in a few days time. There's no, you know, real need to chit your sweet corn. Um, but I do find that it's germinates more reliably if I chit it. And it's so easy to do just on tissue paper that it's worthwhile doing. Then I'm going to do my Eskimo carrots. Now, these are the carrots that we're going to be eating in late Jan sorry, late winter and spring. In fact, I've just harvested the last few of them and they're in the fridge at the moment in sealed top boxes. And they're just a great winter carrot. They just keep in the ground really well. And they're so, you know, carrots kept in the ground are just so much better than carrots kind of kept in a sack or just in compost. And the beautiful thing about Eskimo is that they're really slow growing and they're really dense um, and, you know, but they're really fresh and, and crispy. So, you know, that's why I start them in, in 13th of May. Uh, it doesn't matter when it's the 13th of May, you know, sort of mid-May sort of time. You can sow them as late as, well, actually, I think I've sown some as late as July, but they'll be much smaller carrots. So, you know, I, I really like them. Um, what else is there to say about Eskimo? Because it is an important sowing uh, that this batch, the reason I'm doing them on the 13th of May rather than when I would normally do them, which is the beginning of June, is because they are going to grow in a shady location. So, you know, when you're doing crops in a shady location, it's worth giving them a few extra weeks, maybe even a month. Um, to grow to sort of maturity by comparison with a sunny location. Um, and that can often catch people out. It used to catch me out, you know, because I used to sort of look at other people's like sowing dates and think, well, why is nothing that I grow ever working by comparison with, you know, some other gardener? 
and it was because they were growing in full sun and I don't have anywhere really where I'm growing in full sun and it makes a big difference. So um, next final batch I think of the tumbler tomatoes um, I do do a few batches of those uh, because I find that you know they're a determinant variety and that they just you know they come with a big flush um, of tomatoes and then they kind of finish and I really like these determinant tomatoes I really like the taste of these little bush tomatoes growing outside uh, by comparison with the ones growing in the polytunnel and so I want the harvest to keep on going and so you know I generally do sort of three batches two weeks apart and that just keeps them going all the way through until I'm a bit close enough to the first frost um, and then I'm doing my runner beans and my French beans. Now I've already got uh, runner beans and French beans in the polytunnel, um, but these are about what I consider to be my main crop sowing. Uh, and so by doing them sort of in the middle of May, you're pretty confident that they're going to, you know, really thrive when you plant them out in early June. Beans, you know, French. Uh, beans and to a lesser slightly lesser extent runner beans they really like it warm you know they really like um, the air temperature to be above 10 degrees centigrade at night pretty much the same as cucumbers and tomatoes and peppers um, they will kind of sometimes soldier on if sown uh, planted out earlier than that but I don't they often don't thrive occasionally they do you know, occasionally you're lucky and, you know, timings just all work and the weather conditions all work and they get really well established in a sort of little period of time, you know, when the weather's good. And then when the weather sort of gets a little bit worse and it maybe drops to sort of five or six, that's kind of well established and, and they romp away. But it's just as likely that they won't. So if you want to take a risk, and I often do take a risk doing early things, um, so some spares just in case. So I've now finished all of my um, salad onions that are the varieties that I like to do in early spring and in autumn. So white Lisbon and Guardsman and those sorts of things. Leela. Um, so I start with Summer Island, which I find is the better one for me, at least in my sort of sandy soil for growing actually through the middle of summer um, and for harvesting in the middle of summer. It doesn't taste anywhere near as good in my opinion as an early spring one or one that's you know harvested in winter but it's good enough because uh, we really like salad onions. Coming on to good enough or better than good enough for golden purslane. One of my absolute favourites, I think it's such an underrated crop this it's really great in the salad mixes. It does have this kind of nutritional benefit that it's one of the rare uh, veggies that you can grow that's high in omega-3 fatty acids. And when I say high, I'm not really sure how high, uh, and I suspect it's probably not that high. And you certainly wouldn't want to use it as an alternative to fish oil or something because you know it's nowhere near absor as absorbable as uh, omega-3s from fish oil. But it, you know, it's it's a it's a characteristic that differentiates it from most veggies. That's all I'll say. Uh, what really differentiates it is not the nutritional benefit; it's the taste and the texture of it. It's really lovely. Um, so yeah, get those done, and yeah, another succession of those sweet corn, and I'm going to do some Pentland Brig. Now the reason that Pentland Brig is on here is not because this is the perfect time to sow Pentland Brig, it's just uh, I thought I'd got some seeds and then I didn't have any seeds and then I ordered them and it took a long time to arrive and so you know I'm kind of a bit behind really. Ideally I would do my Pentland Brig back in uh, March um, but it's fine you know I, I'll have kale sowings in future um, months as well. Uh, you can kind of sow kale all the way up until about August really Although if you do it as late as August, it's probably best to grow it under cover, because um, it, it won't probably won't mature in time for a winter harvest. You probably best then waiting for a spring harvest from it. Um, and 
Yeah, more batches of lettuce. So the reason I have so many lettuce in here, uh, well, there's two reasons. One is that we like a lot of different leaves in our salad mixes. So I like to have, you know, six or seven different types of leaves. So you get lots of different colours and textures and all of that um, and taste. But the, the other reason is, well, there's three reasons. So the, ne the next reason is that it just look really nice when the kind of lots of different types of lettuce kind of neatly interplanted. And because we don't grow flowers in the kitchen garden uh, or on my allotment either, we want, we want to do ornamental planting. So I'll show you just a little clip of one of the lettuce beds right now. And, you know, I think it looks really nice. And to me, this is good as flowers. Um, so that's the second reason. And now I've probably forgotten the third reason. Um, Oh, yeah, I get a bit kind of run down from gardening in summer because it's so hot. Uh, I'm doing so many other activities, so much watering to do. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time harvesting. And because we're feeding so many people, like 14 people, and they're all eating so many salads, you know, harvesting salads just takes a long time and it's a lot of crouching down and squatting down. So I like to just harvest the full heads. So I'm sowing a lot because I'm not continuously harvesting the outer leaves. I'm just taking whole heads um, and then planting another one. And so I, it ends up, I dedicate a bit more space to growing them, but it's just a lot quicker and it's a lot easier on my knees. So I'll just do another little batch of beetroot. You feel sorry for me now, don't you? No, not really. Um, yeah, another batch of beetroot. And I've, I've got... Yeah, yeah, because my main batch of beetroot I did back in um, the end of April. In fact, I'm just about to do it actually in a couple of days time. And I'll mention that. Uh, in fact, I'll go back to April and come to the end of April finally. So here are my main crop um, storage beetroot. And these are being done at the end of April when I normally would do them sort of the middle of May, um, and maybe even as late as the beginning of June because of this shade full summer shoot. These are growing in a really shady spot. And if I don't start them now in you know, the end of April, then they're just this sort of size, you know, by the time I want to clear the bed in October and get it replanted. So it's pretty important for me to start them early. Now, if you were in full sun and you started your storage beetroot 28th of April, they'd be huge. Uh, there's nothing wrong really with beetroot that's huge. I mean, it, it's just that you end up not being able to get through a whole beetroot in a week sort of thing and it'd be left in the fridge. So, that's what I'm going to say. Basically, that's why my beetroot is so early. And so you would just need to consider, you know, how much shade or full sun you've got and adjust your dates a little bit, depending on that. So you're basically talking about a window between the end of April or the beginning of May and the, uh, the beginning of June, depending on, I say, light levels. Right, that was a big detour. Right, so back to May again. Um, and an important thing in May. So purple sprouting broccoli. Now in my I don't do purple sprouting broccoli for harvest in summer and autumn. Uh, we just have so much stuff in summer and autumn. There's just not it's not a priority to take up bed space for purple sprouting broccoli. We find that the main priority really is to be harvesting it when we're short of food. And that is going to be in mainly sort of February, March and April. And we grow three different varieties for those three different months. So we do red fire, we do claret and we do red admiral. Now they're all the, the Red Fire and the Red Admiral are from the same seed company and they're designed to work in succession. 
And what I also find is that they do kind of have a two week kind of peak really for their harvest window. So it's better to sow two successions two weeks apart so that you get a nice continuous harvest over both weeks of the month basically that these come to maturity. So I'm going to sow my first batch at the end of May and then I'll sow another one you'll see in a minute in June. And you know it seems like a bit of a fuss and it doesn't always work because of course weather conditions don't always they're not always on your side in the middle of winter and early spring. And so sometimes, you know, you, the crop can be knocked back and then it comes a bit later. And then, so when it comes, it comes and it overlaps with your second succession and all of that. So, you, you know, you can only do your best in gardening. You can't, you know, you can't truly predict things down to a two week period in the middle of winter. You know, nothing can, is that predictable, but you do your best. So, um, yeah and then more salad onions etc so let's look at june okay so i will do a few beetroot in june in a sunnier spot in the garden those are the ones we'll harvest fresh up until the end of the year and I just like that because it means I do have a few beds in the kitchen garden that are empty in March in a sunny spot. And they're the beds that I'll put the early lettuces into. If I didn't do that, I'd end up with a bit of a difficult situation because the kitchen garden would be full of like overwintered veggies and they wouldn't be finishing until at April time or something like that you know if I filled it with salad onions and uh, kales and you know cabbages and all that so it's nice to just have a couple of beds that are in a sunny spot as I say that come free at that time and uh, there's all sorts of different things you could probably put in a bed to come free in that sort of um you know, end of the year sort of time scale so that you can just get them reconditioned and they're ready in March. But anyway, that's the ones I've chosen to do this year. Uh, and I'll do another batch of Calabrese. Now, Calabrese for me, it's also a little bit like purple sprouting broccoli. I'm never really sure whether it's worth growing it given the huge abundance that we have in summer uh, and, and early autumn. But I sow a few just in case a bed happens to come free. And beds do come free because things go wrong in gardening. And so, you know, if something has gone wrong and we've had to pull a crop, and that could just be a, a, you know, a bad infestation of cabbage aphid or something like that that just kind of decimates a crop. And it happens, you know, it, you know, could easily lose like cauliflowers or some red cabbages or something. Um, and if that happened, and it actually happened last year with the golden purse lane, which I was raving about earlier, and it happened because it just got black fly and it was just impossible to kind of fight the black fly on it. You know, no matter what I did, I couldn't really cope. So I just decided to pull that crop. And then it's like, well, what do I put in? And there's all sorts of things you could put in, but, it, you know, it's just nice to have a few of your favourite things that maybe you wouldn't otherwise be able to justify growing just on hand because calabrese seeds are really cheap don't take up much space uh, to, to do a little tray of them and you know if you get the space pop them in we will do though a few cauliflowers and hopefully we will make space for those um, for kind of that October period because things are starting to wind down a little bit and it's nice to have some cauliflowers in October and November just before kind of you know that purple sprouting broccoli arrives and we really like the purple cauliflowers we've got graffiti growing earlier um which is a purple cauliflower that that's the one we're sort of planting out right now so this will kind of provide a kind of continuity of that and then i'll do some kales and again as beds start to come free from you know spring planted lettuces for example finishing in summer and uh, then i'll 
pop kales in because you know those kales will be nice mature plants by then uh, by the time we get to autumn and then we can eat those over winter so uh, yeah and I'm just going to do dwarf green I might do reflex as well just depends whether I can find any seeds for that um, black magic's a really nice one dazzling blue is a really nice one I probably haven't got them all on here right now because this is just my sort of rough plan for June but basically a nice selection of kales and I've got that Pentland Brig that I did um, a little bit earlier so maybe five different kales and then more lettuces and then this second succession that I was talking about uh, a couple of weeks later of the red fire and the claret so why didn't I do the red admiral well I didn't do the red admiral because that one's the one that comes in February sort of January February time and it's never as prolific as the red fire one which comes in March time uh, and that's not quite as prolific as the claret which comes in April time and you can guess why you know I mean they just don't have as much energy because of light levels obviously being so much lower in February than they are in sort of March and April so for me it's nice to have a, a few purple sprout and broccoli in um, February but you know I don't want to put too much of my ground down to that crop because its yield is so low and it takes so much time i'd rather get a higher yield from the march ones and from the april ones anyway that's the kind of rationale for that um and then sort of towards the end of june i'll start sowing again my favorite salad onions which are guardsmen i'm not quite sure why i've got two entries for that basically just to be planted in two locations um and again, just like the Summer Island, I think that you know onions that grow in summer, even though these will be harvested in September, they never taste as good, you know, as as ones that grow in cooler weather. But I really like my salad onions. I don't like calling them spring onions because obviously we harvest them all year round. It doesn't really make sense. But when I say salad onions, some people think, well, you know, all onions can be used in salad. So it's a bit confusing. Anyway, let me not confuse you anymore because I think that's it. That's what we're sowing and growing in May and June. Now, obviously, when it comes to June, I'll have a much kind of more refined plan as to exactly what I'm doing, but this is just my rough outline. So, my name's Steve, this is the Seaside Kitchen Garden and Development Channel, and I'll see you soon.